Um, welcome back, colleagues. We are um, back to understanding social biology much more clearly. I had promised that I will come back to this subject. Um, both classes, evening and day class, we've had a conversation, we have had a detailed explanation of what social biology as a theory explains as the cause of differences that we observe amongst women and amongst men. Uh, I want to note that I left with you a book chapter entitled Ordained by Nature, Biology Constructs the Sexes. Now that is chapter two that we find in this book by Michael Kimmel. Um, I am sure you have gotten that book. Uh, you've gotten that book chapter. Please make sure you read it and you complement the conversations that we started. The key question that we had, the uh, theme that we left, was particularly on what could be the weaknesses of this theoretical explanation of social biology. And the question we asked ourselves was, could there be some of the arguments by social biologists that you find uncomfortable? Um, that's the question we want to respond to. I want to particularly draw something from that chapter, um, which I left for you to photocopy. And in that chapter, one of the weaknesses that is pointed out is that when you want to look at something as natural, then you have closed all possibilities of looking at change in that context. So when, when you argue that differences that we see amongst males and females have a natural root, it means that uh, you then create a situation where we cannot envisage any possibilities of change, which in any way becomes unfortunate. Uh, so that is one of the things I wanted us to start from. I, I hope you have read that chapter and you've been able to identify that kind of weakness. The other thing that I want to look at is that um, um, much of the explanations of this social biology differences amongst men and women draws on experiments carried out amongst animals. But um, there is scholarship that argues that in contrast to animals, human behavior is shaped by environment. That much of who we are is actually a product of the social environment from which we interact. Um, within the home sphere, within the religious setting, within the school as a social institution. All these spaces mold our character, our behavior, and ultimately contribute to how we orient ourselves and interact with other people. So, you know, if, if you reduce this human behavior to biology, you would have negated the social aspect, the, the role of the social environment, particularly socialization, in how it produces us as males and as females. The other thing that we could find inadequate is in terms of how social biology, theoretical explanation, does try to universalize human behavior. Um, to universalize is, um, I don't know whether I can call it generalizing, but when you want to look at all males as the same and all females as the same, and that creates males as a universal category and creates females as a universal category. But we know that um, there are differences amongst men, there are differences amongst women. There are things that you, you may observe in a certain group of men, but you will not be able to observe in, in another group of men. So social biology is, is often accused for trying to universalize human behavior which is not universal at all. Uh, I want to note that the evidence of animals used to support the differences is also selective. For example, 
such kind of evidence seems to ignore examples of animal species where males are not necessarily aggressive or dominant, or where females occupy dominant positions. If you look in, in, in the bees, for instance, you will look at the queen, the queen bee, and this is female, but the character of the queen bee is beyond what social biology might need to explain as feminine coyness and shyness and etc. We also need to note that cultures and societies, which we have argued are, that they form part of the environment that nurtures differences among us men and women, these change from time to time. And therefore you're likely to have different versions of men and masculinities and different versions of women and femininities. The other uh, kind of critique that is leveled against this theoretical explanation is that it seems to be so much centered around biology. And so they argue that you know this theory suffers from biological determinism. They attempt to explain literally everything in terms of biology, which limits the possibility of knowing these differences from other perspectives. The other aspect we want to point out comes from a feminist called Anne Opry. Anne of A-N-N, Opry of O-A-K-L-E-Y. Opry is, is a British feminist, and she's one of those feminists who dismisses social biology and its explanation on argument that men are not always aggressive and dominant and women are not necessarily universally submissive and coy and timid. She dismisses all that and argues that there are many societies in which women are far from being timid and coy and modest and shy and reserved. That you will reach in certain cultures and communities where women are are so aggressive, they are, they are energetic, they, they, they are out, out there, out of, out of the way, and you cannot in any way describe them as timid and submissive. I did remember uh, the 1916 Christian missionary description of females in a Choli land. Uh, they called it Nairotic Kavirondo Gao. And they were so struck by the kind of shrewdness and the character of females in 1915, 16 there. And they wrote a story which, you know, these stories are in the missionary archives in Makel University Library. And they were expressing shock on how females by then could move along with their male colleagues, could sit with men and, and join into the conversations of men, could walk long distances alone without the company of males. And so for them, white females from a Victorian culture were struck by the kind of shrewdness that the females in that sub-region exhibited. And that is to say that really, you cannot reduce femininity to coyness, to timidity, and those other descriptions, as the social biologist suggested. The other one comes from Michael Kimmel, this, this person we talked about, the author of this book. He, he does argue, he's one of the gender scholars, he does argue that um, while biology provides raw material, you know raw materials? Sort of the foundation for human behavior, it is society and history that provides the context and the instructional manual that human beings follow to construct their identities. And so Kimmel argues that these identities of men and women, the differences that we observe, are actually as a result of society, culture, and history. So biology provides the foundational uh, raw material which is picked up and used to construct our identities. 
and I gave the evening group an assignment on um, how people, how as males and females, what we like about ourselves. And we were struck by students' explanations of what they liked about themselves in terms of the body. Looking at the body as biological and its functions as clearly biological, people started to describe what they like about themselves. Eyes, hair, ears. But none of the reasons of why they liked this was biological in nature. They liked this because they were cute, they were sexy, they were attractive, and, and none of this can be alluded to the biological function of the body that they are trying to explain, which in a way shows you how biological body is socially constructed. The other one uh, really wants to pick up on students' discontent and trying to explain that, by the way, the differences that we see among us men and women may not necessarily be out of biology. There are many social interventions that we have seen. Programs around, for instance, um, women's empowerment, education, training, that all of these have gone into determining how males behave and how females behave in the contemporary. So these are some of the weaknesses that we note in this theoretical explanation. Um, I wanted to do summarize that uh, discussion of ours um, like this. This is what we have noted so far, that when you look at something as natural, you have created a precedence in which you are talking about things that cannot change. And if we look at differences among us males and females, which we say we should be concerned with, and we label their cause as natural, then it means that the inequalities, gender inequalities we see, can never change. And that is not uh, a direction that you would want to take. We've talked about human behavior and how this is shaped by environment. Environment meaning social, institutional spaces, family, school, religion, and the spaces where we find ourselves. We have talked about the risk of universalizing um, all men as the same, all women as the same. We have talked about biological determinism. We've talked about Anne Oakley. This is the Anne Oakley we talked about. And how worry is that Social biology creates binaries or polarities in which women are in their group, men are in their group, and women are seen as timid and bees as aggressive. And she argues that actually you can have women who cross that binary, who cross that border. We have seen Kimel on how biology just provides the raw material upon which history and culture constructs feminine and masculine identities. We have seen social biology and the patriarchal sentiments. It's, you know, when you look at who these scholars are and the general argument that is in social biology, you tend to feel that this theory is filled with gender stereotypes that sort of reintroduce male domination and male supremacy and produce females as the other. And when we look at these weaknesses, which other scholars have identified, you need then to ask yourself, what could be the alternative explanation to the differences that we see among us males and females? And that is the direction where we'll be heading. We'll be particularly looking at what could be other theoretical explanations. So when we meet next, we'll be looking at sexual socialization and how it accounts for differences among the males and females.